Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. And in the spirit of the trees, the spirit of living nature, of which all of us are an integral part, with deep gratitude to all the generations before us, to all of our ancestors that have brought us to the present moment, I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising. Uh, today, we're delving into the fourth session of a six-day program on the global Today, in some ways, will be our most challenging session because we're going to be dealing with the phenomenon of environmental anxiety that is affecting everyone everywhere, most particularly our young people. Recent polling has indicated that upwards of 60% of young people all over the world believe that we're doomed uh, because of escalating ecological turbulence. And it's something that all of us need to take in uh, very deeply. It's something that has come to global attention over the last 12, 18 months in a rather acute way uh, when the Secretary General of the United Nations following the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change sixth report says that we are now in code red with regards to climate. And what code red means is that escalating ecological turbulence is no longer avoidable. Uh, in the face of which he said, our governmental institutions are no longer capable of ensuring social, normal activity. So our basic infrastructures are beginning to break down in the face of rising ecological turbulence coming from the climate. The other side of that coin is radical biodiversity loss. Virtually every ecosystem around the planet is suffering denigration. 50% of all the trees have been cut down in the last generation. All over the world, species are going extinct, upwards of a million species. And now one of those species is us as a scientific possibility, not something hypothetical, but climate change is now real and acute. Biodiversity loss is real and acute. And I would add one more thing that is radically challenging humanity. And that is, the war in Ukraine. The bottom line on what's happening is that the global infrastructure, already fragile, already dysfunctional, but basically holding together, is now being further deconstructed. So humanity, as we have this program today, is experiencing simultaneously, I would say, an explosion of climate biodiversity deconstruction and escalating turbulence, and an implosion of the very global infrastructure that we need to enhance international cooperation to deal with these challenges. And I would add a fourth that is very fundamental, and that's just simply nature deficit disorder. In the middle of all this, humans have become so disconnected from nature itself that we no longer have the access, the possibilities for alignment, because we have been become so disconnected. And if you put all this together, 
we're facing challenges having to do with our very survival. And that's what we're going to be delving into today and asking ourselves a very fundamental question. Given this, how do we navigate? Where is there hope? Where is there light at the end of this tunnel? How can we feel empowered given what's confronting us? And how can we act together in such a way, not only with each other, but with the natural systems from which we've been cut off and are now spinning out of control to bring a basic equilibrium together for humanity because we've reestablished an equilibrium with the larger planetary ecosystem. So that's the subject that we're going to delve into. It's a deep subject. It's a challenging subject, but it's the bottom line. It's the question that humanity now needs to face uh, collectively. Before we dive in, let us take a moment and let us pause as we always do as we begin our Humanity Rising sessions. And let us just center ourselves in our bodies. Our bodies are nature. Our bodies belong to nature. We are children of nature. And for the next minute or so, let us breathe together. And let us center ourselves in our hearts. And let us love together. Let us feel each other at this moment while we breathe and while we commune through the beating of our hearts. Thank you, everyone. We'd like to commence our program by showing all of you the trailer of the film Connecting the Dots. This six-day program is being developed in partnership between Humanity Rising and the film Connecting uh, the Dots, uh, the director of which has been uh, Nomi Weiss and executive producer Tom Eddington, who will be introduced and speak uh, during the program. Uh, it is a very powerful film that really looks at uh, the global phenomenon in a very multi-dimensional way of mental health challenges uh, for our young people, which is the meta theme uh, for our six day program. So Georg, if you'll play the trailer. Do people know what mental health is? Do people know what mental illness is? Every single one of you in here that's battling, every one of you that feels like you're alone, every one of you who feels like nobody understands you, how many of you relate to what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. There should be some kind of a system that talks about mental health problems in schools, like in lessons just anywhere really. They're having to deal with a lot of very, very ill people rather than 
it being more about prevention. Youth mental health, it's the same story everywhere I go. I want to get to the root of it and to really figure out the why from the mouth and the stories of, of young people. I can sometimes feel a panic attack. Like I woke up this morning and I knew for a fact I was going to have a panic attack. I'm taking this because I think if I look in my face, it'll calm me down. I don't even see myself live after high school. People need to hear the truth that most kids our age are not fine. I never saw myself represented anywhere. I felt like it was very invisible. Not only being a woman, but a black Muslim woman, I just thought that those problems were for everybody except people like me. I don't want other young people to feel the way I did growing up. Finally, I have a chance to fight the system. I think we just start hearing from young people like myself when making policies related to somebody's mental health. There are so many things inherent to a space when you build it up properly that help people become more resilient and help people find community. When you make sure a space is safe, where you make sure that everybody feels welcome into a space, people feel like they can be themselves. I'm telling my story. It's literally making something painful inside beautiful. I'm so sick of being unhappy because I'm so young and I feel like I need to be able to experience the world in a positive, healthy way. I just wanted to be accepted for who I am and I just wanted to be loved. It took me five years to finally open up about my mental illness, but it wasn't as scary as I thought. It was one of the best things I've ever done. Young people have to know that even though at times they may feel that they're in the darkness, if they could just know just to hold on, that light is going to come over the horizon. The minute we start talking about mental illness, then people will not be ashamed. I just really hope the world could change. Thank you. Powerful film. Uh, Humanity Rising is going to be doing a special screening this Saturday. We'll tell you a little bit more about it, but encourage all of you wherever you are, to go on to the website, uh, connectingthedotsfilm.com and, and uh, link up and do some community viewing of a very important documentary that opens up uh, one of the fundamental issues confronting the human race right now. And that is that our young people are deeply troubled and are seeking to cope with unprecedented challenges and they need our awareness and they need our support. Uh, so uh, thank you all. We wanna now commence our uh, actual program. I wanna introduce here Christy Allen, who's been one of our moderators for the week. Uh, she's a very dynamic young woman uh, from Canada. Uh, she works as a knowledge equity specialist in the organization Frame uh, that uh, is dedicated to youth empowerment. She has a master's degree from Simon Fraser University in uh, public health. Uh, so Christy, uh, thank you so much for your uh, commitment to these issues. Uh, and I turn now the program over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jim, for that wonderful introduction and a grounding practice to get us all started together. And welcome back to the Global Youth Mental Health Summit, everyone. We're so pleased to join you today for another exciting discussion. So let's recap a bit on what we've discussed already this week. On Monday, we explored the state of global youth mental health and key themes included resiliency mindsets, finding sources of strength and support through community, toolkits and music, mind-body connections, and how shared understanding and preventative measures can promote positive mental health and well-being in young people. On Tuesday, we explored themes of belonging, community, and spirituality. We discussed how youth are innately spiritual beings and the importance of finding your community and knowing you're not alone. Yesterday's topic delved into gender and questioning, and we explored the importance of parents and youth alike finding commonality in their own questioning and learnings about gender and the gifts that come from exploring these questions in safe spaces with supportive communities. To end our week, we'll be talking about parenting and youth mental health on Friday, and we'll be joined by all of this week's youth film participants. And then finally, on Monday, we'll share a rebroadcast of a previous event that explored mental health, substance use, and music, all taking place inside a life-sized harp, which is very cool. 
So we hope to see you at all of these events throughout the rest of our week. But as a reminder, if you do miss a session, not to worry, you can watch them back later. So let's delve into today's topic, which is environmental anxiety and exploring the connection between the environment and youth mental health. The scientific data and many global scientific leaders have determined that this is the most critical decade in human history. If we don't significantly course correct our lives, other species and the planet will be changed forever. Today's youth understand this reality and the significance for the future that they will inherit. This harsh reality is contributing to what has been termed environmental anxiety and finding hope in these seemingly desperate times is essential. Parents, educational, political industry, NGOs, and other leaders have a responsibility to provide today's youth with a sense of hope. So today we're very excited to share in a global conversation with Dr. Jane Goodall, participants from the Connecting the Dots film and director Noemi Weiss. So let's get started by introducing our panelists for today. I am honored to introduce Dr. Jane Goodall. She came to world recognition in the 1960s through research on chimpanzees in Tanzania that was made famous through profiles in National Geographic. It was Dr. Goodall who transformed world perception of animals from its to he and she with names, personalities, and innate worth. She went on to champion animal rights and to found Roots and Shoots, a global organization of youth working for environmental and social justice. Welcome, Dr. Goodall. So joining Dr. Goodall today is Noemi Weiss, director of Connecting the Dots. Noemi is an award-winning writer, director, and producer that has spent over 20 years telling stories on the big and small screens, from her worldwide advertising products to her award-winning documentaries. As a humanitarian and an advocate leader, Noemi journeys where stories take her to bring voices to the world's most vulnerable. Her films have been seen in more than 100 countries, receiving numerous awards, and most importantly, making a difference in communities around the world. Welcome, Noemi. We're also joined by Tom Eddington, an author, executive coach, and business advisor, and executive producer of Connecting the Dots. He holds an MS in organization dynamics from the University of Pennsylvania, and is a scholar of conscious leadership. He's passionate about bringing more conscious leadership into the world, which he does through his coaching and advisory work, film and media projects, and board positions. As CEO of Endangered.Global, he brings his commitment and experience to impacting climate change and biodiversity loss. And lastly, I'm very pleased to welcome participants from the Connecting the Dots film to share in this conversation. So today we're joined by Jake Bradshaw from Toronto, Canada. He's a recent graduate of Queen's University where he studied politics, philosophy, and economics. And ever since his own struggle with depression and anxiety, he's been passionate about mental health advocacy. Jake is a co-founder of The Social Reset, an organization that's working to address mental health crisis by empowering young Canadians to spend less time in technology and more time connecting with the offline world. Welcome, Jake. And lastly, it's my pleasure to introduce Shannon Ackerman. She's a recent graduate of Eastern Kentucky University, where she majored in psychology, and she's currently pursuing her PhD in neuroscience at Kent State University. Shannon participated in the Connecting the Dots film during her freshman and sophomore year of college, which greatly contributed to her road to recovery from mental health challenges. So thank you all so much for joining us today for this important conversation. And I'm very pleased to now turn it over to Dr. Goodall to share her expertise on today's topic. Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to this important and fascinating event. It's a pity we can't all be together, but I guess we've all got used to uh, a virtual world. Anyway, as Jim said so eloquently, we are going through very grim times, not only environmentally, but socially and politically too. And this war with Ukraine causing so much human suffering. And you know, I've been on this planet long enough. I lived through World War II. And at the end of World War II, we said, never again. And we've seen the same sort of warfare and cruelty happen again and again. But this is about being positive. The reason that we're suffering from climate change, loss of biodiversity, and actually this pandemic that has ruined so many lives, world economies, and so on, it's all our fault. It's because of our deep disrespect of the natural world and animals. And 
as we cut down the forest and we destroy the habitats of different creatures. And let's not forget all the animals in factory farms where they're crowded together. This is all giving opportunity for a pathogen like a virus to jump from an animal to a person. If it bonds with a cell in that uh, animal's body, uh, that human's body, it may create a new zoonotic disease. 75% of all new human diseases in the last 75 years have been zoonotic. And now we have this new epidemic of depression, particularly among young people. But you know, way back in the late 1980s, when I was traveling around the world, the, the young people were already beginning to lose hope. And as I traveled around and, and talked to them, they, some were just very angry, some were distressed, depressed. Most were just apathetic. It doesn't seem, they didn't seem to care what happened. And so I began asking them, why do you feel this way? And they all said more or less the same because you have compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, of course we've compromised your future all of you young people who are listening. In fact, we've been stealing your future ever since probably the agricultural revolution, certainly since the industrial revolution. But when the young people said there was nothing they could do about it, there I didn't agree. And that's why I began our program, Roots and Shoots. It began in Tanzania with 12 high school students and they were depressed about various things that were going wrong around them. And they wanted me to fix it. I said, well, you know, I love Tanzania, but I'm not Tanzanian, but maybe together we can come up with some solutions. So they came from eight different schools. And I told them to go and gather the friends who felt the same. And we had a, a meeting. And at that meeting, we decided the main message of Roots and Jude would be every single one of us makes some impact on the planet every single day. And we have a choice as to what kind of difference we make. There are some people living in abject poverty or other grim conditions who have very little choice, but others of us, we can choose what we buy, what we eat, what we wear. We can ask questions like, how was it made? Did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of unfair wages in other parts of the country? At any rate, this is what we decided our main message would be. We can make a difference. And when people come to me very depressed, many adults, and say, well, we've kind of given up because we look around at the problems of the world and we just feel very, very depressed. There's nothing we can do as individuals. And I tell them, you know, we keep hearing, think globally, act locally, but that's the wrong way around. If you think globally, you cannot help but be depressed. I defy anybody to think about the problems globally today and not feel depressed, but it's the wrong way round. I say to them, well, where you live, is there anything you care about? Do you worry about homelessness? Are you thinking about the refugees uh, from Ukraine? Well, get together with some friends and discuss what can we do about this situation? You can raise money, you can, uh, if, if there's a lot of homelessness, you can um, volunteer in soup kitchens, you can work out programs whereby surplus food is delivered. You can grow organic food, clean, healthy food. You can help depressed people find ways of making a difference. And when you do something like that and see that you have made a difference, even a tiny one, that makes you feel better. And then of course, you want to feel better still. So you do more. And as you do more, it's like a kind of outward circle you gather people in because they become inspired by your passion. And then knowing that around the world there are other people just like you doing the same little things, then you dare to think globally. So Roots and Shoots that began with these 12 high school students is now in 65 countries around the globe. It's got members in kindergarten. We've even got a few little preschoolers. Um, it's very strong in university and everything in between. 
very strong in high school too. And we decided at that first meeting that because everything in nature is interconnected, so are all the problems that we face today interconnected. So we decided that every group of roots and shoots would choose, they would choose, we wouldn't dictate, it wouldn't be top down. They would choose problems relevant to uh, the country they lived in, that's their culture, their religion, their age, the environment, but one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. They don't all have to do each one of those three, but they need to share what they've been doing so that everybody gets to understand how all these problems are interconnected. So that's how Roots and Shoots began. And I have to say that the young people in Roots and Shoots, but other youth groups as well, are rising to the challenges we face today in the most extraordinary way. It's what gives me the greatest hope for the future. And yes, it's scientifically proven now that being in nature is helpful to healing mental as well as physical ailments. And in Japan, where they invented forest bathing, doctors can prescribe forest bathing as a prescription. And they're doing the same in Canada, time in nature. Even if it's just out in a city park, even if it's in a garden, even if it's looking through your window at a tree waving in the breeze with little birds and perhaps bees buzzing around. And one of the solutions is bringing, bringing nature into our cities because it's the people in the inner cities who suffer most particularly. And one story which I find kind of appropriate, which I just thought of uh, just now, we've been working with refugees, Roots and Toots has been working with refugees in Tanzania, where they come from Burundi, where there was a genocide, and they come from Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC. And one of these young women from DRC uh, managed to get to the UK. She was so traumatized. She couldn't speak. She couldn't look anyone in the eye. So her psychiatrist decided, okay, I'm going to take her into this very quiet sheltered garden. And in that garden was a rose with buds and every day they went out. And this young woman, could feel it. she drew the rose buds and she drew the rose as it began to open out and she drew the full rose. And by the time the rose had fully opened and all the roses in that little garden had fully opened, she was speaking again and she could look her psychiatrist in the eyes. Well, if nature can do that for this woman, you know what she'd seen that put her in this state? She'd had her baby yanked away from her, one and a half year old baby by a Congolese soldier and cut in half. That's what she'd seen. And yet, even after that, nature could restore her. We're part of the natural world. We depend on it for air, for water, for food, for everything. But as Jim said, what we depend on is healthy ecosystems, an ecosystem where each little plant and animal has a role to play and is interconnected. And I see it as like a beautiful tapestry of life. And as a species becomes extinct, it's as though we pull a thread from that tapestry. And if we pull enough threads, the tapestry hangs in tatters and the ecosystem will collapse. And that's what's happening. But it's just so important that young people who are depressed find a way that they can actually take action because it's the taking action and knowing that other people are taking action that leads to hope. And hope isn't just wishful thinking. Some people believe, they say, hey, Jane, how can you have hope? We've seen so many disasters. We've seen animals disappearing. Well. Hope is about action, as I say, and I see us, our human race, at the mouth of a very, very long and very, very dark tunnel. And right at the end of that tunnel 
is a little star shining. It's no good sitting at the mouth of the tunnel and saying, oh, I hope that star is coming soon, because it won't. What we have to do is roll up our sleeves, crawl under, climb over, work our way around all the problems that lie between us and the star. And those are the problems of climate change, of loss of biodiversity, of, of poverty. People are destroying the environment in their desperate effort to feed their family, to get more land or get some money from timber or charcoal. We've got to solve the unsustainable lifestyle of so many of us who have so much more than we need. And we've got to solve corruption. We've got to solve pollution. All of these things seem impossible, but you have to take a little piece at a time. If you think I can't solve all these problems, you're right, you can't. But as we go through that tunnel, we meet other people, we reach out to them. And there are people on this planet tackling every single one of the problems, these obstacles that lie between us and hope or, or the star. And they're all interconnected and we've just got to get together and cooperate to realize we've got to think of all these problems as one big whole. And that whole can only be solved if we cooperate and work together. So that's the message I have for you. I concocted it after hearing what was said before. It's different to what I planned, but maybe it fits better into what we're going to be talking about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodall. There's so much wisdom in what you shared. And I think I'd like to turn it over to the rest of our participants. Noemi, please go ahead. Yes, well, thank you so much, Dr. Woodard. I'm really uh, moved by your words, and I sympathize with a lot of what you're saying. Um, if I can relate it to my work on the film, I'm proud to say that Connecting the Dots for me is the first film that we have done digitally completely, no paper. And to have been able to do a production without any paper has been a challenge, but I don't have any more printers at home. Nobody had used any paper and we managed to sign all documents and to travel around the world to tell these people's stories without paper. So um, it was a big contribution and consciousness, but more so when you talk about the importance of being in nature, um, a big challenge for me when thinking about the narrative of the film, dealing with youth mental health and so many people sharing so many difficult stories. Um, my decision was to film outside, outdoors and bring nature to the story. 95% or maybe more uh, of the film has been shot in the outdoors, not to the liking of my sound person uh, who was complaining all the time, but my intentions were to bring the beautiful world that we have around us and inspire that in spite of it all, um, young people who are glued to the computer, who have been in isolation for so long, who due to the depression that they've been having, they did not move out of bed and encourage them at least to, when watching the film, being inspired to, to go out and see the world and experience. We have a beautiful world around us. So we are with our film trying to, to bring this inspiration. And that's why this, this talk is so important. And hearing you, I can see how we can connect all the dots of, of the message. And it's just so wonderful um, to, to hopefully bring that hope that we definitely bring in the film, that big call to action and have everyone participate in the way that they can one at a time, but I think that uniting everybody's hearts and minds will be able to make a difference. And that's, that's the goal here. So um, that's my part right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Noemi. And I, I think I keep hearing that hope is action and we find hope in community and through connection to one another and, and to our natural world. And I think that's a really beautiful sentiment to share and, and to find some inspiration in. 
And I'm curious, Shannon or Jake, if you have anything you'd like to share about uh, finding hope through your experience with the film and, and your connection to the environment as well. I can start, Shannon. Yeah, we're always, always seeing who's going off mute first to start. I, I really resonated with, with what you said, Dr. Goodall. I think that hope is so important. Not only does action lead to more hope, but I also think that hope leads to action in the first place. And so when we're talking about climate and the clim climate change and the climate crisis, I think that we need to be really careful about the way that we're framing it and the language that we're using, especially around young people, because if people feel hopeless in the way that it's being communicated to them, that prevents action and that leads to inaction. So I think that's something that we really need to acknowledge and, and be aware of. And I find a lot of the times with the media and social media and the news, there's a lot of doomsday headlines. And so as a result, I don't actually like to read the news, which my parents who are probably watching always, you know, encourage me to, to be more informed and take a different perspective. But I think that we need to be more thoughtful about how we're communicating these messages around climate change and the climate crisis, because if we can communicate it from a lens of hope and what you can do as an individual to make a change, that, as you were saying, will lead to action. And once you start making, taking that first step and doing something about it, that leads to a ripple effect, as you were mentioning. Um, so I really like the way that you framed it. And I think that we should all be talking about it um, and talking about climate change in a way that makes us feel hopeful and makes us feel like we can make a difference. And Jake, you've said something really important. We are surrounded by doom and gloom. It's in the media every day, every single day. So you don't like to read the news. Um, I sort of have to for what I'm doing, but, but when I, every time I have a chance and I talk to the media a lot, I say, you know, guys, we need to know the doom and gloom. We need to know what's happening, but what yeah. we have to do. But as I was traveling around the world, whether it's really or virtually, and of course virtually uses less, uh, less of this uh, gas and oil and stuff, um, there's so many incredible projects and amazing people. Please give equal space and time to those because when people read the good news, People are saying, gosh, he did that, she did that. I can do that, I can try to do that. They saved that animal from extinction. And I'd just given up and thought, well, this animal's going extinct. But no, I think maybe I can do what they did. So that's my message to the media, almost every opportunity I get. So I'm glad you brought that up. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're, that you're sharing that one. Them. That's that, that might make me more inclined to, to read read the news if that happens. And share the good news. Absolutely. If you don't mind. Um, so I was like the film heavily inspired me on my road to recovery from things that happened. And like there's important things within um, climate change. There's so many different environments one can grow up in. If um as you get to know me, I grew up um, really poor. And at one point I was, my family was homeless when I was a child and things were wrong. And as I'm growing up through college, um, uh, I am scared of climate change. It, it terrifies me. And I remember in April um, on Earth Day, um, someone committed, uh, someone did uh, self-immolation uh, self as a boot, it's a Buddhist practice. And basically they set themselves on fire in front of the Supreme Court. Um, and basically what this is, is that it's the monks, it's a, it's a Buddhist practice in which the monk embodies, the mo it's the most powerful way um, they can do, whereas they hope, to re they hope to awaken other people by letting them know that they are also in a burning house by showing everyone that climate change is real. This person was from Colorado and they did pass away from their injuries. Um, and it was to let people know that they were in a burning house. 
that the world itself is a burning house and we humans are the cause of this burning house. And it's an interesting thing because I remember Jake listening to you say, I don't want to read the bad news. And it was like, do you, I wonder, done by people who have were booted. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but uh, I was interested by what you said, Jake. I think sometimes the news can also be a good wake up call too. Even though sometimes it's a dooms, it can be a dooms and glooms. Like I hated listening to the news. All my parents do is listen to the news. I, every time I go into the car, it's like turn off the radio. It's like, I don't want to listen to it anymore. I'm so tired of hearing it. Um, because I listen to the same two channels <laughs> and they're all, they're both just wrong, each one of them. But sometimes it can be a good wake up call because it's just like, that's what's going on and so it just genuinely makes me think about that kind of stuff because sometimes it's a good wake-up call for me because climate change scares me but I didn't know how bad the house was burning down when totally. until I read the headline and and I agree and I think there's as Dr. Vidal was saying there's a there's a place for us to acknowledge the the crisis and what's happening and we all have to sit with that fear and that anxiety and that uncomfort because it is scary. And I think even Jim's introduction at the beginning, I was sitting here watching, and you know, I was starting to feel a little bit, a little bit panicky and anxious. And I think it's really important to sit with that and it's important to acknowledge. However, it's also important to take that fear and that anxiety, as you were saying, and turn it into something and mobilize people because I think that the alternative, if you're feeling really anxious and you're feeling hopeless is to crawl into bed and remove yourself from the world. And, and right now we need every single person believing that their actions can make a difference. So I think there's a place for both. And I think we also have to be good to ourselves because sitting in that doom and that fear and anxiety all the time is, is not good for good for our mental health. So I think there's a place for both as you were, as you were saying. And, and there also comes to this point of how can we navigate this for young people without making them feel hopeless too though. Um, because that's, a, that's also a good thing. Like we have to have this big thing because as, adult, as adults, like we can't always have to keep hearing bad things to have a wake up call. Like we cannot keep doing this. Um, like the like with the environments that children have to keep growing up in and having to grow up almost so fast to have a change. Like they have to keep, like it's almost like they have to grow up so fast just because older people don't want to do anything. And that's not saying, that's not pointing fingers. It's talking about some of the older generation just doesn't want to believe and that kind of stuff and doesn't want to do things. And had, it's just, if that makes we, any sense. We, we had a, um, a, a panel on endangered in February here on Humanity Rising. And one of the guests was Dr. Sylvia Earle. And when, when asked the question, uh, Dr. Earle, after all of these decades of the work you've done, what brings you hope? And she said, I'm incredibly hopeful because we've now in the last 20 years realized we're living on a finite planet. And when you understand that it's not unlimited resources, that there is a, a finite number of resources, it changes your consciousness, it changes the way you see the world. And so she shared, um, that's what, what brings her hope. And uh, we had, uh, uh, American author Charles Eisenstein um, on one day and, and Charles said he's not worried about the, uh, the, the climate and the climate change. What he's more afraid of is that uh, we're going to use technology and people are going to be living in concrete buildings separate from nature, watching a virtual reality of nature, eating uh, food that's grown in a, in a factory and uh, will be disconnected and that dystopian future makes him much more afraid. That horrifies I me.
Jake, I wonder if you can speak a bit to that because I think that sounds similar to some of the work you're trying to do to get folks more connected to the outside world and away from technology a little bit. Yeah, I, I started an organization about a year and a half ago called the Social Reset, really focused around social media and technology. And part of that was a realization that there is a lot of evidence and research that shows that social media is having a negative impact on our mental health and, and social media companies know that. And so we've been trying to figure out how to get young people to spend less time on their phones and less time on social media, more time in the community, more time in nature, more time being, more time being mindful and intentional. I think one of the biggest realizations that, that I've had through the work that we've been doing, we've developed workshops and, and brought them into schools. And we got a lot of feedback from, from kids saying, you know, this is really great information. Thank you for sharing it, but I can't stop. I, I, I physically cannot prevent myself from going on my phones. And so that's led to the realization, which I believe now that most young people are aware that phones are making them feel bad. Same thing when it comes to the climate crisis, it's not a problem of lack of awareness. Everyone knows that climate change is happening. Everyone knows that their phones are harming them in, in mental, in, in different ways. And so I think the realization that we came to is that a lot of people are using their phones as a coping mechanism. A lot of people are using their phones because of an underlying feeling of a lack of connection and community. And so the work of getting young people off their phones, I think similar to the work of getting young people to engage with the climate is about bringing back a sense of community to young people which a lot of the, the reasons around COVID um, has led to some challenges. So I believe that there are underlying problems as you as we highlighted in the film, Naomi, um, where young people are feeling a lack of connection to each other, a lack of community, and that's bubbling up into some other significant challenges and the use of technology, the use of social media and potentially climate inaction is not a problem in and of itself. It's a symptom um, of an underlying problem that, that young people um, are feeling. Right, exactly. If we can deal with understanding, Jake, that it's a symptom, then we need to deal with the roots. And where do we start with the roots? It's nature. We are all animals. We are all creatures of this world. So that's the importance, right? We have lost the sense of roots and, and bringing everybody to roots and, and, and understanding that. But I think that in, in many conversations when I speak to in, after say screening and, and I see parents saying that I, I had a father in, in one of the presentations who said, I'm doing my best and I'm working really hard to give everything to my children. He's working all the time. And that toy that he brings forward is not really what that kid needs. That kid maybe needs 10 minutes with that father. It's, yeah. this, it's this world of consumerism that has changed us in a way to, to think that everything that we get and the more material that we get is going to, to, to satisfy our needs. And it's, it, we have to go back to roots. I bring that message in all my films. How can we come back to roots? But I have a question, if you don't mind, to Dr. Budo. Uh, we speak a lot about when in mental health and we've had an expert, Donna Volpito, um, with us on Monday who talked about the brain and the rewiring of the brain and how rewiring of the brain is possible when we talk about, oh, that person will not change, but actually, yes, the brain waves can change and the brain waves can grow just like trees. So can we have that? Because that gave me a lot of hope. And the more I learn about the brain, it really makes me think that if we try, um, and it takes 21 days, apparently, to rewire the brain, it's not that long. Um, we can have some changes happening in this world of, of mental health, health depression. 
can we think about nature and the environment and our world as the brain? Can we rewire all of this? Maybe not in 21 days. What's your thought about that? Can we put them together? Well, that's, that's the reason for Roots and Shoots. It is about changing mindsets. It is about thinking differently. And you know, one point is that chimpanzees that I spent years studying, they are our closest living relative. And the brain is almost identical and the immune system and the structure of the blood and things like that. But having realized how similar we are biologically and behaviorally, we're different. So I, I asked myself, but what is the main difference? The main difference is the explosive development of the intellect. Note, I say intellect, not intelligence. And I personally think that possibly was at least in part triggered by the fact that at some point in our, in our evolution, we hit upon the way of communicating as we're communicating now uh, with words so that for the first time, we could teach our children about things that weren't there. We could make plans for the distant future. We could bring people together with different knowledge to try and solve a problem. So here we are, the most intellectual creature on the planet, but we have lost wisdom. No intelligent being would destroy its only home. And that's what we're doing. We're destroying planet Earth. And somebody said this, but I truly think only that, you know, that there's been a disconnect between this clever brain and our heart. I don't know why poetically we seek love and compassion in our heart, but we do. And so only when head and heart work in harmony can we attain our true human potential. But let's face it, our potential is huge. And another reason for hope, and, and I think, you know, rewiring the, the brain of the planet, if you like to think of it that way, is the fact that scientists are beginning to turn their minds, their brilliant minds, into things like renewable energy and uh, ways of depolluting things and simple things like changing from intensive factory farming, which is totally destroying the planet, totally destroying biodiversity, destroying the soil, and we all depend on the soil with all these chemical pesticides and herbicides, polluting the ocean with all this artificial fertilizer. But people are now beginning to realize the importance of going back to the old ways and perhaps enhancing them with things like permaculture, talking about regenerative agriculture, talking about rewilding the landscape, big areas of land being set aside. So what you're talking about is happening. And perhaps one of the most important things is that big corporations are beginning to change. And I was talking to the CEO of a big international company in Singapore. And he said, Jane, for the last 10 years, I have really been working to make my company an ethical company. And he said, that means the, the salaries of the people in the countries where we source our products must be fair. They must actually be, you know, related to the sort of wage they would get if they were in the US or UK or something. We want to help the communities where they live. We want to, be, to ensure good wages and living conditions along the supply chain. We want to have ethical practices uh, saving electricity, turning off lights, uh, all that kind of thing in our home offices. And we want to treat our customers fairly. We don't want to cheat them by charging too high prices. And he said, there were three reasons why uh, this, this took place in my mind. He said, firstly, I saw the writing on the wall. I saw that we were using up nature's finite natural resources faster than in some places than nature could replenish them, which would be the end of it all. Secondly, consumer pressure. People who are more aware and providing they're not living in poverty, which of course we must alleviate, 
uh, can make choices as to what you buy, did it harm the environment, etc. And they don't want to buy things that are made unethically. But he said, what did it for me? It was my little girl coming home from school one day. She was eight years old. And she said, Daddy, they're telling me that what you're doing is hurting the planet. That's not true, is it, Daddy? Because it's my planet. So it's, you know, young people are beginning to push their parents. I meet so many parents who say, well, of course I recycle. Of course I turn lights off. Of course I do. My kids make me. And I had, I had the most wonderful letter the other day from a mother in China. And I met her little girl when the little girl was 10. She didn't speak a word of English. Went back two years later, she was speaking good English. And the mother said, she's um, learned to speak English because of you. She wanted to talk to you. And she got roots and shoots. The mother helped to get roots and shoots going in the school. And she said, I used to be just a housewife. I went into a shop and I just bought what I wanted. I never thought. But now she said, I think about everything I buy. And she's actually written a whole book of, of recommendations for roots and shoots that's gone into the school district in Chennai. So children are making this big impact. And if we put all the different stories of what's happening together, it shows that we are doing exactly what you're talking about. It is, it is reshaping the way the world is working. But too often these things are all in isolation. We don't see the cumulative effect of the good things that are happening. And so, yes, doom and gloom. If we carry on with business as usual, if the Trumps and the Bolsonaros and the Putins get their way, we are doomed. But that's what the young people are fighting against. That's what the young people growing up into the future leaders of the world who think differently and then we'll see change. Do we have time? Not unless more people take action. Because action, you know, without act, without hope, you, you don't take action. You just become apathetic. There's no point. I mean, you know, if what you're doing isn't going to make a difference, why bother? Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. No, we need hope. And, that, and hope leads to action, and action leads to hope. And they kind of go this way and that way. But you've got to have hope to start the action. Or you've got to be pushed into starting the action. And you know, right through the pandemic, I don't think we had one single roots and shoots of our hundreds of thousands around the world who got deeply depressed, clinically depressed, because they were still working. Or they were still doing projects, sometimes at home. Um, and they were still taking action even though they couldn't be at school. Which is very important to take action and to inspire the youth. The statistics are showing that the young generation right now is the loneliest generation and the more depressed generation of any other in history that the statistics of anxiety and depression have, are at a high that have never been before. Um, that the, the, the people, the young people that are taking their own lives, suicide has been at an all times high. So hope of course is very important and we need those young people to take action in, into doing something that brings them hope and I think that the problem is that they are the hopeless generation. They, there's a title for them right now. Doctors and, and professionals in the mental health world are talking about the hopeless generation. And when you talk to young people, this is what they say. Everything is so dark. That's why in the film, in my, my little way of, of bringing at least a message of hope, I'm trying to, to bring that in, in every narrative and showing that we are all there to support them. But there's something that has gone very, very wrong. And maybe it is technology. Maybe it is that globalization. Maybe it is the way that 
everybody is more informed. This is also the generation that is more informed than any other generation that we ever met. So that sometimes we say that ignorance is bliss. <laughs> and, and in this case, I think that the, the knowing and reading the news and, and seeing what's happening has paralyzed them. So it's up to all of us to take action on, and these type of conversations I think are so important, but there is a real problem. When we talk about understanding that there is a problem, there is a real problem. And let's, the, that's why we are doing what we are doing. That's why we continue talking about it. So I would like to, to know from Jake and, and Shannon being part of the film and having gone through the journey together with me as well, you know, where do you see that from, from the young people's perspective? perspective um all right so uh naomi i remember like you remember how i was i definitely remember how i was so i joined the film very shortly after um a suicide attempt from me from mine um and i remember just i felt drained and numb to just being surrounded just it seemed just like everything was always bad just seemed like the more time, it seemed like every question that, I, that would be answered, everything would just still nothing, everything would just still be bad. It seemed like every experience was bad, nothing, everything was bad. And when I would get it, when I got into the film, you know, you kind of, you take a look into like how you are. Like you look back, I, I look back and I was just like, things were really bad and I kind of want to go ahead and like keep going like because I was a freshman when I entered the film I was 18 I'm 22 about to be 23 in November now um, and I want to go back to Dr. Goodall's point about nature being very therapeutic um, I take a walk every day I go into the trees I literally sit down I just walk in there for a second and I feel better I watch the sunset every day I sit in the sun almost every morning and that is healing all in itself. That is the best medicine for me in my, like in my life. Um, but in the journey of it all, it just seems like you become surrounded. And I know like, especially living in the United States where all you're surrounded by is school shootings, having school shooting drills, hearing about people dying left and right, and just all these protests and then nothing being done. And then you hear about nothing being done. You just get numb to nothing. You just become used to nothing getting done. And then I remember like when the film came out, um, you know me I remember talking to you after the film came out and you said that I looked hopeful and like I looked better and it was because after the film came out after we had completed the film I was like you know maybe something can change and so many things <laughs> did change um, because I was inspired by the film and I was inspired by living and I was inspired by seeing other people live I was inspired by Jake, for example, you know, living through his anxiety and depression. It's not easy to live through these things. It's so hard, especially as a young person living through um, those kinds of things, especially living in the world that we do now. And it was like, you know what? If these people can live the way they do, like live while going through this, so can I. And I can still keep going. And I was able to find peace with that and be inspired by that. That's, that's powerful, Shannon. And thank you for, for sharing. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, Naomi, because I think that the, there is a huge problem when we talk about mental health. It's really hard to know, however, whether the incidence of mental illness has increased or not, because one thing that I've noticed, even in the last five years, is there's been a huge reduction when it comes to stigma around mental health. And so as a result, we have a lot more people who are comfortable speaking up about mental health and sharing their experiences. And I think part of the increase that we're seeing in reported 
you know, mental health challenges is a result of that stigma reduction. There may also be an, an element around an increase in incidence, but I think in some ways that, that's, a, that's a positive because we, we have people who are comfortable sharing their experience. And I, you know, my, I took a semester off of university in, in 2017. So I was in my second year in university. I took a semester off and up at that point, I had not told any of my friends. I think only my parents knew that I was struggling. And I saw a huge shift even within my community over the past five years from 2017 to now in terms of people talking about mental health. It was not something that we talked about at the dinner table. It was not something I talked about with my friends. It was not something I talked about in the workplace. And now, I mean, I'm, I'm also working in the mental health field, so that's probably part of it. But now mental health is a constant conversation that I have with friends, family, loved ones on a daily basis. And so I think that I've just experienced a huge shift as a result of stigma reduction. And that's something that I feel really hopeful about and that I'm excited about. I think there's still a lot of work that we need to do from the perspective of improving access to high quality mental health supports and services. But I see a lot of hope there. And one of the things my psychiatrist said to me, which really, really stuck with me was that the most important thing when it comes to your mental health recovery journey is feeling hopeful. So it doesn't actually matter whether you're taking antidepressants or you're doing talk therapy or you're doing mindfulness or you're you know, doing nature-based therapy. What is important is that you feel a sense of hope and hope can come from so many different places and it's unique to individuals. Sometimes hope means going on a walk and seeing the sunshine and feeling happy. Sometimes hope means having five minutes of of a break from the way that your mind has been, you know, making you feel negative throughout the day. And I think it can come from really small things. It doesn't need to be a big action. And that's, I think that that's something that's really important and yeah, something that I really believe. And I think it's great that we're talking so much about hope because it applies both to mental health, but also to, to the climate crisis as well. Maybe uh, picking up on that, and thank you, uh, Shannon and Jake, that was beautiful. Um, what is it that those of us who, who are older can be doing to support you and Christy, uh, if you want to jump in as well, what, what is it that we um, uh, uh, older generations can be doing to su support you and your peers um, to, to help you on this journey? With, with mental health or climate change or both or? Uh, hope, mental health, climate change, just how can we best support you and your generation? I think I'll, I'll start and then I can pass it to you, Shannon. I, I think one of the things that's really hard when it comes to mental health is you cannot solve someone else's mental health problem. And, and, you know, me as someone with mental illness can't solve it either. It's something that's not going to go away. And I remember a conversation that, that I had with my parents when I first saw a psychiatrist and the three of us went into an appointment and my parents asked the psychiatrist, what can I do to help Jake? What can I do to support him? Because as a parent, you want to fix, I, mean, I don't think fix is the right word, but you want to solve their, their mental health challenges. And the psychiatrist, my psychiatrist said, there's there's nothing that you can do to fix or support this person. And so I don't think that's necessarily the right way to think about it. But the point was that this was something that I had to help and manage on my own. And so I think the role of a parent, an adult, a loved one is all about being there for the person who is struggling. So you're not there to necessarily give them solutions, to give them advice something that my parents laugh at and I laugh about a lot, unsolicited advice. That's not necessarily your role. Your role is to be there, is to love them, is to show them that you care about them, that they're important to you. And when they're having a bad day, to be at their side, hold their hand, give them a hug and tell them that it's going to be okay. Um, I Is that all right if I get the baton now, Jake? Totally. Awesome. Conversations like these are fantastic. Keeping up these conversations. Um, 
sometimes people ask, uh, you know, what can we do so, to support the other generation? Naomi's film was probably the best uh, way to start it. And then things like these are also the best way to start it, is to keep having conversations to stop stigmatizing mental illness. Now, anxiety and depression are slowly becoming destigmatized, but we still have tons of mental health disorders that are still stigmatized, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, um, and it all ranges. Um, and um, like Jake said, unsolicited advice is not there. And yes, J, um, Jane M and Jake said it too. Listening to each other is just the very beginning. And sometimes the best person to uh, talk to from the standpoint of somebody who has struggled with mental health is a stranger. Um, Naomi had uh, the benches in the film. And I remember I was watching the film with my parents and they were like, that's such a good idea. Why don't we have that here in the US? <laughs> like that, would, that was such a good idea just to like sit there and talk to somebody and say what you're going through. Because sometimes you don't wanna talk to your parents. Sometimes you don't wanna talk to your friends. Sometimes, because these are people who've known you your entire life, they're, you feel like you can feel their judgment, but so, no stranger doesn't, a stranger doesn't know you. Sometimes that's why people like, to, that's why you like talking to your therapist. They don't have any background on information on you. <laughs> they're not gonna dig through your files and find out your whole entire life story. Your parents know you <laughs> from the moment you're born, usually. Um, but having a conversation, having the conversation, the lack of judgment, keeping up these conversations, these, uh, these panels, these things, being able to talk about it open-endedly, that's what the older generation can do. And to continuously try to understand it without offering unsolicited advice, without offering unsolicited advice is good. And how about for you, Christy? And thank you, Jake and Shannon. Great question, Tom, and it was actually going to be my question to Dr. Goodall, but um, in my work with, with mental health advocacy, I, I think for me, it comes back to when I support youth and caregivers um, in mental health system transformation efforts, we really focus on two things, and that's capacity building and allyship. So capacity building is starting together from the same place, and so really sharing the information needed to start together. Um, in a good way, and, and that will look different for every opportunity. And then allyship is having that person who can support you along the way. Um, and that's a lot of that is informal in relationship building. And so I, I think that really leads to feeling empowered to take action and to do something. And when you have those two things in place and you let young people lead the way and families lead the way, um, really beautiful things can happen. And and I think Dr. Goodall's example of Roots and Shoots of, of having these groups uh, direct what they would like to work on is a really fantastic way to help young people feel empowered to create their own solutions and uh, be hopeful. I was just gonna add one thing that I forgot and I put the link in the chat, but there's a fantastic resource called Be There, which was developed by Dr. Dorg, which is all about how to support someone who is struggling and they give examples and steps and videos and I, I I think it's a fantastic resource just to learn about what your role is and how you can support someone else who's who's struggling with their with their mental health. Does it it's a, sorry go ahead Dr. Wooden. The comment that I would make is um, I've been two and a half years here where I'm talking to you from which ha happens to be the house I grew up in but I'm living here, uh, it's owned by me and my sister, and she's living here with my sister's daughter and two more or less grown sons. And the 18 year old went through deep, deep depression. I mean, he wouldn't leave his room except creep down to some food and he just played loud music and everybody was very worried. They did go to a psychiatrist and get some advice because he wanted it. And the psychiatrist said the time will come if you're just being there like you talked about. Uh, and then one day he'll come out with it all. And he did, he cried a lot. 
and he came out with it and finally told his parents, uh, his mother rather, because his father had died. Well, when I talk about these young people in Roots and Chutes, you know, I was traveling all over the world and giving lectures and meeting many, many young people. And I think that it's absolutely true that talking to a stranger is so much easier. I've been on planes with people where an, an adult will just pour out all his troubles to me because he knows he's never going to see me again. It's the same with young people. They, they talk to me about their problems. I've had many talk to me about their depression and their, those kind of problems. And very often we keep up a correspondence afterwards. We're not seeing each other, but they're writing to me. And then, you know, because they then, I encourage them to take part in Roots and Shoots. Of course I do. It's my main goal for the rest of my life to work with young people and give them hope for the future. And so I don't think there's been one single case where I've met a really, really clinically depressed person who's spoken to me, who hasn't come out of it through through action, through hope, and through talking to a stranger, feeling, well, they can tell me anything because uh, I'm sympathetic, I don't know them, I don't know their history, and probably I'll never see them again. That, that's so true, uh, Dr. Goodall, because I experienced that um, in my films, and Shannon and Jake uh, know that I've talked to more than 300 kids to make this film. And on a regular basis, because we had the visual diaries that I had created. And it was hard at times to be listening to all of these stories, of course, because some of them were very tough and Shannon was going particularly through very dark moments as well. Um, but I think it was the fact that someone was listening. And, and if, I, if I may, right, uh, Jake and, and Shannon, um, is having someone that listen, it doesn't matter who. So um, that's important. And I think these conversations are so important. And we bring the environment today, which um, I think it's one of the things that I have heard talking to so many young people that afflicts them the most. And they cannot verbalize. They cannot talk about it. They don't know where to start. So I think your words about one thing at a time um, are very wise. And I think that's the hope. If everyone can do one little thing at a time, um, then the world is not so big and so so black as, yeah. as many are seeing. And one thing that's really, really important, and I cannot think how I haven't mentioned it until now, and that is how many people have been brought out of depression back into the world by a relationship with a dog. Mm. Sometimes it's a horse, usually it's a dog, occasionally it's a cat. I mean, this can make all the dogs, I don't know, there's something about dogs. Um, there's amazing stories about how they treat autistic children. There's a, they have an amazing intuition for what's wrong. They know when you're feeling sad and they can come and comfort you in a way that can't and they can say anything to a dog anything I mean the dog can never ever repeat it so what they've said can be a secret forever but they have somebody to talk to somebody who cares somebody who's always there for them Dr. Goodall I'm so glad you bring you bring that up because my little my little cheerleaders my dog is right next to me right now and she's been uh, cheering us all on throughout this conversation and I'd like to bring Jim back in to help us uh, finish out this really wonderful conversation today and explore some of what we've talked about so far. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, everyone. It's been a very powerful uh, dialogue. You know, and it reminds me of the classic definition of the difference between a pessimist and an optimist, that it's not in their analysis. The difference is that the optimist thinks that they can do something about it. And uh, to your point, uh, Jake earlier, and Jane, your point, and Shannon and others, 
what gives hope, I think, is this notion that in the midst of all the craziness and chaos, we're actually doing something about it, whether uh, in one domain or another. So I just wanted to bring in that optimism is based on one sense of empowerment in the face of the external environment. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, one thing I, I wanted to uh, ask you, uh, Jane, uh, since we have you and you've been laboring for, geez, since the 1960s, if I remember correctly, with the chimpanzees and uh, in East Africa there. Um, what would you say, what is the condition of the chimpanzees today after this kind of the 60 years of curation that you have uh, been providing? Because I think that would give us a barometer, a little microcosm of, of both the challenges and also um, the uh, possibilities for hope, uh, given your particular attachment to that uh, species that's so close to us in, in DNA and, and personality and type. They're too close to us, Jim. They're not my favorite animal by far. They're too like humans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't really start the task of seeing what could be done about protecting them until 1986. I was just studying them. I was in my own beautiful Gombe world in the rainforest and the best, most wonderful days of my life. And then at a conference, actually in, in uh, Chicago, we brought the people studying chimps in different parts of Africa together for the first time. When I began, it was just me. By then, there were seven other field sites. That's when I learned that forests were disappearing, that chimp numbers were dropping. I left the conference as an activist. I went as a scientist. And so what's happened during those years, uh, there has been a lot more killing chimpanzee numbers have continued to drop. But now, because we've got uh, much more awareness in all the villages, because we have this program of alleviating poverty, Fukari, uh, which is very holistic. It includes things like scholarships to keep girls in school so they have a, a chance of secondary education. It's microcredit opportunities so people can start their own small businesses. It's restoring fertility to overused land. But it was when I flew over Gombia, have I said this? I'm not sure, in, in, in the late 1980s, and saw that what had once been part of a forest stretching across Africa was now a little island surrounded by mm. bare hills. And realizing that unless we alleviated poverty, and help people understand that, you know, there was other way of living without destroying the forest, working with them, not dictating, same as with roots and tubes, letting them make decisions, giving them the technology to monitor the health of their village forest reserves. So they have chosen to create, to set land aside to protect chimpanzees. And they have chosen to put land aside to link up scattered communities. That pro six other African countries. So there are areas which would have gone, but for us, chimpanzees, small communities struggling in really, really tough environments in Mali, for example, where it's hot and dry and fascinating to see how the chimps react to that. But if we hadn't been working there, those chimps would have gone because the Dinka people were hunting them. Now the Dinka people are protecting them. And the same in Senegal. So, okay, we've saved some chimps, probably quite a lot, but fighting the international wild animal trafficking, we're fighting it, we're working with it, we're, but you know, it's, it could be depressing. So you have to concentrate on what we have done the chimps who are still alive, the people who understand that, you know, it, it's not good for their own future if they go on destroying and killing. So I can't really answer your question except to say it's given a lot of people hope 
A lot of people now have much better lives. That gives me hope that if we spread this program, more people will have hope, more people will have better lives. And so in Africa, we're making a difference. That's all I can say. Well, the fact that you're uh, still making a difference uh, in the ways that you are is, is, a, is an inspiration uh, to people worldwide. You know, I was watching David Attenborough's latest uh, film uh, the other day, age 93, I think he is now, and still out there with all his heart, uh, you know, speaking and doing his documentaries. You know, I thought, and I said to Claire, actually, I, you know, we ought to start a global campaign to have a, a joint Nobel Peace Prize for uh, David Attenborough and Jane Goodall. Uh, it's just a way to honor uh, both of you for not only a lifetime of work, but a lifetime of illumination through your commitment and through your work that has inspired people literally all over the world. And, you know, many of us uh, work hard and we have impacts, but I think, uh, uh, Jane, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's such an honor to have you here because, you know, you're one of these people of our generation uh, who has uh, stood tall and wide your whole adult life in a way that has had a global impact. So I, as we bring this session to a close, I want to just honor that and, and honor you uh, that, uh, these young people, as, as, as you've heard, you know, have respected and, and loved you from afar. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's well-deserved and, and uh, needs more widely to be honored and acknowledged. So I just want to thank you for being you well, uh, Jim, all these decades. You. Thank you for saying all that, but you know, I owe so much to my mother who supported my dream when everybody else laughed at me when I was 10. And I've got the most incredible teams of people working to help because you can't do it alone. You need to mm. gather. And there's such amazing people in my teams around the world that that's another reason for hope. The people you have who you can rely on and trust and count as friends who help in the battle. Mm, yeah, yeah. It takes a village. <laughs> it takes a village indeed. Uh, and so uh, just thank you on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Nomi, do you want to make uh, any final comment? Uh, and then uh, Christy, maybe you can uh, say a word about uh, tomorrow. I know that we're going to be having a, a special screening through Humanity Rising of the documentary on Saturday. Uh, and Shannon uh, MacArthur will put the uh, information and the link uh, in the chat box. Uh, but Nomi, uh, any final comment you would like to make? And then Christy, uh, say a few words about tomorrow, then we'll bring it to a close. Thank you, Jim. Well, it's been a very enlightening moment uh, to share this, this panel discussion with all of you and Dr. Woodall. It has been uh, wonderful to be sharing this conversation with you. I, my father told me when I was very little that I should never lose hope. And that's part of uh, my, my motto and, and doing human rights films with very difficult topics. I do need to know what's wrong in order to bring them to life, but you're always bringing hope. So thank you. Thank you for, for your wisdom, for your dedication, for your commitment, for everything that you're doing. Um, it's very inspiring and um, it's, it's such an enormous honor and pleasure to have you with us. Jake and, and Shannon, thank you for being such ambassadors of the message and continuing to inspire young people around the world not to lose hope. Uh, seeing you both talk about it so eloquently today in where you are today, it's, that's the hope. Um, so thank you, thank you for continuing with, with me on this mission committed to everybody who, who share their stories with us. Christy, as usual, you've been great. Thank you so much for holding us all together and Tom and Jim, 
as well for offering this platform. To the audience that has joined us today, I would love to thank you for, for being part of this conversation. Um, let's follow the advice of Dr. Goodall. Each one of us, let's do one thing at a time today. Think about what you're eating, think about what you're doing, think about where you're going and how you're spending your time. Um, for the sake of your children, if you're adults, maybe just have a little conversation with them, just check in and see how they are doing. And if you have a chance that it's not raining outside, um, go out and see what's happening in the world. Um, I invite you to join us all in, in, in what we are doing and trying to bring this conversation together. Raise your hand and be with us and join us at uh, connectingthedotsfilm.com and see if you can continue the conversation in your community by bringing the film and sharing and opening up the discussion. So thank you all. Thank you, Nomi. Thank you. Christy, a word about tomorrow? I have to go. Bye bye, everyone. I've got bye, to Jane. Bye. Love you. Yes, love you all. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for today's panel and to all our participants for being so active in the chat. We see you and, and we appreciate all the connections that you're making throughout this discussion. So, for our final discussion of the week, we're going to explore parenting and youth mental health. Our modern society has become disconnected from the earth and each other, and the state of natural mental health has been lost as a result of the loss of good psychological, social, and environmental conditions. In the past, these healthy conditions were created by family and community, which held the core values in common, supported each other, and provided needed support. And we've forgotten how to achieve harmonious relationships and be effective parents. So reconnecting with ourselves, with each other, and with nature holds the promise of achieving a healthy environment for youth and families to thrive. So tomorrow we'll be joined by Dr. Meredith Sagan, again, uh, Noemi Weiss and Tom Eddington and Jim and the folks from Humanity Rising. And we'll be accompanied by the youth film participants from all around the world who previously joined us this week. And we'll reflect on what we've collectively shared and what we need to change for a brighter future ahead. Back to you, Jim. Thank you, Christy. Uh, thank you all. This has been a marvelous session. You know, I always just feel privileged when I'm in the presence of someone like Jane Goodall, uh, knowing who she is and what she stood for and how she radiates love and compassion and deep caring uh, at a global level. You know, she's uh, one of the most uh, widely recognized uh, people in the world. Uh, there's very few places where she's not recognized for who she is. And so it was an honor. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, Nomi, for uh, bringing her into our uh, community today. That will do it for us um, for now, uh, everyone. You're all invited to the after session chat group. You'll see the link in the chat box. You're welcome to join us. We'll see you then uh, tomorrow uh, for the fifth of six sessions on the, the global phenomenon of youth mental illness, where we'll be focusing, as Christy said, on parenting and community as we hold our young uh, in love and compassion. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you.